We got quiet. <laughs> Real quiet. No, oh, yeah. <laughs> this week was an interesting week. Now, if you're tuning in on Facebook, there. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see everybody. Um, this week was interesting, though. We obviously had some storms. We were up at the cabin, and it was hailed that one afternoon, and just made me think of some of the judgments. Obviously, the plagues that Moses with Israel and Egypt. And we had taken pictures of some of the hailstones, and the hailstones were two inches. You know, up at, uh, you know, we just watched our truck get pummeled. Looked like uh, Zach took the ball peen hammer and just tapped little dents all over the hood of our car, our truck. But, anyways, uh, two inch hailstorms coming down and made me think of like over there in uh, Israel when Moses, some of the plagues there, because they had hail. They were size of, I believe they were size of 75 pounds. And, uh, you know, the Lord said that anything that was not in shelter was destroyed, you know, killed cattle and things like that. And it, you know, wiped out all the shrubs and trees. And I can't, ima I can't imagine some of these damages, you know, what hail does at two inch, you know, and then I think it was in Wisconsin, they had tennis ball size, baseball size, actually went through the roof of Walmart. And uh, just, the, the, you know, these are things that during the tribulation, you know, the plagues, the trumpets, the seals, there's some serious, you know, storms coming. And just thankful for the church, you know, his body, that's his bride that he's preparing us. We'll not go through that. We'll be raptured. But uh, you definitely see, and, you know, it seems like there's an increase in things. Uh, but sometimes my memory is not as good as it used to be, too. I'm sure storms have always been bad over the years. But it seems like there's an increase in earthquakes and plagues and pestilence. And it just seems like, you know, we're at those end times ready for the rapture which would be okay. But good morning, everybody, and welcome out to the Grace Gospel Church. We've been studying the heroes of faith and pretty incredible stories about individuals. <clears throat> you know, last week was a great story with Gideon. You know, individuals study, st you know, struggling with, you know, anxiety, you know, nervousness, depression, just to find, can find encouragement that God's extremely patient with us like he was with Gideon. This week we're going to study a man now named Jephthah. And uh, I can honestly say I've not heard of Jephthah. You know, he's in the Hall of Faith in Hebrews chapter 11, 32 there. But, you know, I've read Judges before, but I didn't recall his story. And reading his story and studying it, it was, you know, I talked about, we're, we're going to look at Samson, but Samson's next week. But Jephthah, you know, if you've ever been betrayed by family, if you've had uh, struggles with family, they have fighting over inheritance. If you, uh, f you know, people judge you from where you've come from, they judge you based on, you know, your parents or your family. I think you can resonate. Your story will be able to resonate with Jephthah today. And I think the moral of the story for Jeff, what I got out of it was, you know, God can use you wherever you are, whoever, wh whatever family you've come from, whatever has happened in your past, that God could still use you. And Jephthah was quite an inspiration, and we'll share that today. We'll get through that. But again, welcome out. Prayer list, if you want a copy, you can email me. Uh, Grace Giving, we just want to thank all the people that support the ministry here. The, the blessings that we have through the financial support that we can help people around the world. When Pastor Benjamin had died, we could help those people out. And just some people here, you know, in the, in the United States, we could other believers that we could help out. But also this building, you know, when we, just incredible that, you know, our finance here, that we paid another large payment on the building and we actually owe less than $20,000 on the building. And it just, it, we're, so we're paying this thing off, you know, leaps and bounds. And again, it's, uh, people just so faithful in giving and supporting and it is very encouraging and I just want to thank all the people that faithfully pray for the church and give and support because that's what it goes to and we just want to thank you from that for that it's nice to be surrounded with people that care also the announcements Bible camp we'll have a camp meeting next week 
we'll go over, we do have 20 kids on the list. It's about the max for the sleeping arrangements for this year. However, that doesn't mean that a kid cannot come up for the day. So a kid, if you know a kid want to come up for the day, the parents want to bring them up, they could stay for the day and then leave in the evening. But we do have right around, I think it is 20 or 21 campers applications that are registered to go. And we probably will have at least 10 adults every day, you know, if you're preparing lunches or dinners or breakfast. So you could probably assume right around 30 people per meal. But we're gonna get so uh, we're gonna I'm gonna talk to Cody today and we'll get some uh, finaliz finalization on things. We're gonna go through the camp supplies today downstairs after church. And uh, we'll have a camp meeting next week just to finalize some things for next week. Traveling, you know, uh, Tony and Steve are in Palau. So if you don't know where Palau is, I think it's a couple hundred miles south of the Philippines, southwest. And they, that's where originally Tony's from. And um, they'll be gone for four months. Just keep them in prayer. A lot of other people traveling. Kim and Andy are in Alaska on a cruise. Hopefully Andy's enjoying. I think he wasn't too keen on going on a cruise, but I think he'll, I think he'll have a good time up there with Kim in Alaska. My mom and dad, Pat and Christy, you know, Glenn, lots of people, Andy or Alex. Seven points of truth, you know, go through them, you know, it's something we review every week. We've all sinned. You know, it was uh, at the wedding yesterday, we, we definitely, you know, talked about that. You know, the Greek word for sin is hamartanon, and it means to miss the mark. Yeah, we've all missed that mark. You had to be perfect to get to heaven, and I was conceived in sin. I missed the mark at conception. We've all missed that mark. You know, we're born with a sin nature. You know, what you see is that's my sin nature, it's the flesh. And um, you know, because of that, we've all earned the right to die, a physical death and spiritual death, the second death. But because of God's grace, he took that death penalty, he died on the cross, he died a death that we all owed, he paid that payment for sin in full. So we don't have to die as spiritual death, a second death, as Revelations 20 talks about. But we've all earned the right to go to hell. Heaven is a perfect place. If your name's not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, you're not going. And the only way to get your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life is coming to Christ by faith, believing he died on the cross for your sins and was buried and he rose again for you the third day, simply trusting in Christ alone. Man cannot earn salvation. In Ephesians 29, it says, For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And if anybody has to boast that they're doing something, well, I go to church every Sunday, they do not understand Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace, unmerited favor, you don't deserve it, nor can you earn it, nor can God be indebted to any man. Because if he could be indebted to man, that means man could earn it. Man cannot earn it. It's all by his grace. Where, great, where mercy was great and grace was free. We sang that song this morning at Calvary, and that is true. For by grace are you saved through faith. It's not blind faith. It's not leap in the dark faith. It's by grace and it's trusting in Christ, his finished redemptive work at Calvary. And people call it cheap grace. Well, I would say people cheapen grace when they add to it. When they say Christ didn't do enough, I got to do my part. That cheapens grace. That cheapens what he did at Calvary because he left glory revealed himself in the flesh. And he went to the cross, and he died a death that we owe, and he paid that perfect price for, that perfect price for sin by his death on the cross, his resurrection proving he paid for sin in full, and yet people will deny that and say it wasn't enough. That cheapens grace. That takes away the glory from God. And that's sad, because it's all by his grace. It's not flu-flu grace either as somebody has told me in the past. It's grace. It's awesome grace. It's amazing grace, as the Son one song. And uh, he will give you eternal life the second you believe that. Christ died for our sins. Christ died, for, that's history. Christ died for you, that's salvation. For he hath made him to be sin for us. Who knew no sin? He was sinlessly perfect. That's why he can make a perfect sacrifice that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We receive his righteousness when we come to him by faith. We receive his perfection. 
That's why we're allowed in heaven. How many sins did he pay for? All of them. There's not a sin that man has not ever lived or ever will live that he had not paid for. He paid for all sin for all mankind, all trespasses. Colossians 2.13 says, And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together, made you alive, having forgiven you all trespasses. How? Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, he took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. That's salvation. And over and over in the Bible, I think Herman says, how many times does it say, believe Herman in the New Testament? 265 times it says in the Bible to believe. Over and over and over. It's about believing. And John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him, whosoever believeth in him, should not perish but have everlasting life. It's about believing. It's not about going following the sacraments, going to communion, going to confession. Just like the thief on the cross, you can look at Luke 23. You know, he did not get down and go to confession. He did not get down and go to water, be water baptized. And Jesus says, today thou will be with me in paradise. The thief on the cross reviled Christ. He ultimately said some mean things, and one of them changed his mind. Both of them reviled him. Both of them mocked him, and then one of them changed his mind. He repented. He trusted in Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, today thou will be with me in paradise. It's simply believing. When do we receive eternal life? We have it right now. It's what God promises in Titus 1, 2, in hope of eternal life, which God cannot lie promise before the world began. The gospel is everlasting. I believe it's Revelation 14, 6 is the everlasting gospel. And that's what it's always been about. It's what you receive. And we can know we have eternal life the second we come to Christ by faith. These things I've written unto you, believe on the name of the Son of God. And that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. That verse is bookended. And I love that it's bookended with believing on the name of the Son of God. And we know who he is. His name says who he is. Jesus is, Yahshua is salvation. Yahweh. And Christ is the anointed one. The Messiah. The one that died for the sins and resurrected. So his name declares who he is. So when you trust in his name, you know exactly what he did for us. So hopefully online today, maybe somebody is, doesn't understand eternal security of the gospel, that you receive it, that you can know you're going to heaven and you can know you're not going to hell. Why? Because Christ paid for every one of our sins. That would be the specific learning outcome today. As we go through the heroes of faith, we come to a man called Jephthah. Jephthah was an incredible Man, he's a mighty man of valor, tells us. But the heroes of faith, the hall of faith, are individuals that had, were given a promise. And we've talked about this for the weeks now, so we're not going to go through this verse by verse in great detail. But these all individuals died in faith before the Messiah came. A seed was promised to them. A seed that said that all the nations would be blessed, all the families would be blessed by this, this seed. So these individuals all died in faith, receiving the, having, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. As they looked down through the time of the future, they could see Calvary, they could see the cross. And Jesus in John chapter 8 says, Abraham seen my day and rejoiced. And Abraham was a believer in Christ alone. The Bible tells us, tells us that. All of these, all these all, and these all having obtained a good report through faith, you know, it's impossible to please God without faith. Hebrews eleven six. You know, we access his grace by faith. You know, Romans 4, 20 and Romans 5, 2. And it's all about having faith. When we're saved by it, and after we're saved, we learn to live by faith. Live by grace. You know, it's obviously yielding to the indwelling power of the Spirit in our lives. But the seed... It was promised there in thee to Abraham, all the families of the earth be blessed. And then he expounds on it in Galatians, in Galatians 3, 6. I love these verses. Galatians chapter 3, incredible chapter. Even as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness, taken from Genesis 15, 6. Abraham was saved by faith. He is the father of faith. Know you therefore that you have which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. 
The scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith. The Gentiles, us, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, in thee shall all the nations be blessed. Back there in Genesis, it was the families, and here nations. How are all the nations and families blessed? Because of Christ. And he tells us that in Galatians 3, 16 through 18. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made, and he saith not unto seeds as of many, not plural, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. Love this next verse. And this I say that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ. The covenant was confirmed before God in Christ. In Genesis chapter 15, the cutting of the covenant. We know that. And Abraham, he did not do anything. He sat there and actually fell asleep. And that was all confirmed before God in Christ. Then the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more promise, that, but God gave it to Abraham by a promise. These individuals were saved by faith. So we're going to look at Jephthah here in the Old Testament. It's J-E-P-H-T-H-A-H. -H -H, but in the New Testament, it's spelt like that an E instead of an H. And what shall I say more say, that the, for the time would fail me to tell Gideon, and of Barak, we studied him with, with Deborah, and of Samson and Jephthah. So today we're going to look at Jephthah. He's in the hall of faith. He's the part of the heroes of faith. And ultimately 33 there, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, and stopped the mouth of lions. We know that in Judges, we have 13 judges, and Jephthah is the ninth judge. And we know when we read, ultimately, in uh, Judges, we see the constant failure of man, and we see the constant grace of, ultimately, Jehovah God. If you have your Bible, turn over to Judges. Seventh book in the Bible, and I'll give you a page number. We have a Bible at the church here. It's going to be in the 300s. Probably 290. Well, it starts in uh, 295 for the book of Judges. If you're at home, again, seventh book. Let's read the first two verses. Now, Jephthah, Jephthah the Gilead, Gileadite, was a mighty man of valor, and he was the son of a harlot. And Gilead begot Jephthah. And Gilead's wife bare him sons. His sons, wife's sons, grew up, and they thrust out Jephthah and said, said unto him, Thou shalt not inherit in our father's house, for thou art the son of a strange woman. Same dad, two sets of moms here. One was his wife. And he had sons with him. One was with a prostitute. The Bible says Jephthah was a mighty man of valor in verse 1. Gilead was his dad. However, his mom was a harlot. Gilead's wife had other sons that were not illegitimate. However, Jephthah, his own family threw him out. His own half-brothers threw him out. His half-brothers threw him out. The other brothers did not want to split their inheritance with their father's house with Jephthah. They said Jephthah was the son of a strange woman. And it's interesting what happens here with Jephthah, what, they, what, the, what his own brothers want later. But the question I have is for you is, have you ever been judged because of something your mom and dad did, or maybe your family, you know, maybe your last name? Jephthah was being judged for something his mom and dad did. Jephthah never asked to be born into this world, but now he was born into this world and he was being judged by his own flesh and blood, his own half-brothers judging him and ultimately not wanting to split the inheritance. He was a mighty man of valor. However, it didn't matter. His mom was a harlot. She was a prostitute. And he was not good enough for their family. And I say, have you ever been judged for not being good enough for your family? Have you ever been judged for something you did in your past that people still use against you today? 
I think all of us have. I know some of our friends from high school, and they come to church here today, and I know some of our friends from high school, they've, we've heard this, they say things like, you think you're better than us. <laughs> no, absolutely not. I'm, my, my wife and I are a couple sinners saved by grace. You know, I got saved at a Bible camp at a very young age and went after my sister died. I knew Christ died for all my sins at Calvary and he resurrected through me and he gave me eternal life. And I knew that at a very young age. I got saved by seven, eight, nine years old. So I've known I had eternal life my whole life. So we don't do these things to be proved we're saved. We don't do these things to stay saved. We don't do these things to be more saved. We're already saved, but we want people to know to have, they can know they have eternal life. In the book of Jeremiah, <clears throat> I watched the movie, my wife and I watched the movie Jeremiah last night. But it says this, and it is ultimately, this did burn in my heart. Then I said, I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name, but his word was in mine heart as a burning fire shot up in my bones. And I was, very, and I was weary with forbearing and could not stay. And I think, you know, as a child of God, sometimes I... That word burns in us. His word burns within me, and it didn't. If I didn't share, it feels like I want to share. I want to share God's love with people. I want people to know how much God loves them, and He paid that debt of sin in full for them. It just makes me feel good. It makes I just want other people to hear what I heard as a kid. This is, this is the greatest message, and I never get tired of hearing it. I just want people to hear the truth, because eternity. I know so many people that are trusting in their good works, good deeds. They're self trusting in their self righteousness, but you know the alternative where they go, hell. It's for eternity. And I tell you what, just like the rich man and Lazarus in Luke chapter fifteen or sixteen, it was Luke sixteen. The rich man, when he's in hell, you know he's talking to Abraham and he says, "Send somebody back from here." And, and who does he ask to tell? He doesn't say, "Go tell the strangers." He wants his brothers saved. The people in hell, they want their family saved. They don't want, you know, their brothers and sisters and their moms and dads and their, their future grandkids to come to hell. The rich man wanted his brothers to be saved, not strangers. And we want our friends to hear the truth. We want strangers to hear the truth. But at no time did we ever think we're better than anybody else. And I do want to, if I ever gave the impression that we think we're better than anybody, I'm sorry, because that was never, that's never ever been the case. We just want people to hear truth. But Jephthah was being judged for what his mom and dad did. Have you ever been judged by your flesh and blood, brothers and sisters? Your own flesh and blood, a brother and sister, mom and dad, a cousin. Families argue, that's for sure. Families will not talk for years because what's, because what's said or done. And Jephthah's half-brothers were judging him. And they asked him to leave. And he actually goes live, he goes and lives in Tob there. I don't know exactly what verse, in verse 5 there. And it says the men of Tob were vain. You know, probably scoundrels. You know, it's pretty sad. Have you ever had your own flesh and blood and want your inheritance? Jealous, greed. All of us have heard families fight over money. Again, very sad. Too bad families just can't, can't do what's right. Divide fairly. You know, we know someone else that has not treated fairly by his own brothers and sisters. Matter of fact, he had half brothers and sisters too. John chapter 7, 5, it says, For neither did his brethren believe him. You ask, did Jesus Christ have brothers and sisters? Yeah, he did. Mary was a virgin when she gave birth to Jesus, but she wasn't a virgin forever. Mary did not remain a virgin. She and Joseph had kids. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 55 through 57, it says this, Is not this the carpenter's son? Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brethren James and Joseph and Simon and Judah and his sisters? Are they not all with us? 
Whence then hath this man all these things? 57, and they were offended in him. But Jesus said unto them, The prophet is not without honor, except in his own country and in his own house. Yes, Mary and Joseph had children after the Messiah, after Christ was born. Jesus was sinlessly perfect, and I can't imagine growing up with a sinlessly perfect brother. <laughs> Can you imagine, you know, Mary and Joseph? Why can't you be like your brother, Jesus? <laughs> I don't know if that was like that, but I can, you know, sometimes parents will do that. We, should not, we shouldn't compare siblings. But his brothers and sisters were probably jealous, especially during when he turned 30, when he started his ministry. He was getting a lot of attention, for sure. None of them believed. Not one of his brothers and sisters believed until after the resurrection. Now his own flesh and blood, his half-brothers. But it's after the resurrection is when they came to Christ by faith. You see, in 1 Corinthians 15, it tells us this. When we get down, I think it's verse 7 here. But again, it's after the resurrection, they trusted in Christ alone. And after, we know, I believe it's two of them, James and Judas, Jude, they write the book of James and they write the book of Jude. I believe both of them are Jesus' half-brothers. In 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 9, it says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, because it's the gospel that saves, ultimately down there, which I preached unto you, which, which also you have received, and where you stand, by which also you are saved. If you keep in memory that I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Now, a lot of people will take that believing in vain, and they're like, well, they didn't believe enough. That's not accurate. That's not, what, that's not the context of this. Believing in vain is related to the resurrection of Christ. Because if ultimately, if Christ does not resurrect, our faith is in vain. In 1 Corinthians 15, 7, it says, nothing to do with your faith, because their faith is in Christ. But if Christ doesn't resurrect, your faith is worthless. So in 1 Corinthians 15, 17, it says, and if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, and you are yet in your sins. So the resurrection is part of the gospel. It proves that he paid for all of our sins, because if Christ doesn't resurrect, he's a dead savior. Our faith is in vain. It's worthless. Put your faith in Joseph Smith, Buddha, the Hindus, whatever it is. Because they're saviors, they're all dead. They're, they're, they're still in their tombs today. If Christ does not resurrect, their faith is in a dead savior. And if he is dead, he cannot save anyone. However, he did resurrect. And their faith is not in vain. So I want to make a point here. Because this is an important point to understand eternal security. See, in John chapter 10, verses 17 and 18, if Christ has power over his death, he did, he did resurrect his life after his death. He has the power. He has the power over sin, death, and the grave, and Satan does not have dominion over him. He has power over Satan. In John chapter 10, 17 through 18, in a great chapter, it says, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it up again. In 18, now, and it says, no man taketh it from me, but I lay it down for myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. This commandment have I received of my Father. See, Christ has the power to lay down his life, but he also has, has the power to take it up again. So he has the power over death for his life. Now, what does he do in the next chapter? John chapter 11. He gives us an example that he has the power over death other people's lives. In John chapter 11, 43 through 44, Mary and Martha, friends of Jesus, they know their brother's sick. He's going to die. Mary's like, tell Jesus to come. Well, he purposely waits until Lazarus is dead. Then he comes to Mary and Martha. It's an incredible story to read. But ultimately, John, 40, John 11, 43, John chapter 11, verse 43 through 44 says this. When he had thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes. They had placed him in the sepulcher already, the tomb wrapped in grave clothes. And his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus said, him, loose him, let him, let him go. Christ 
has the power to raise others from the dead. Think about this. If Christ has the power over his death and resurrects his life, he gives, and he lives eternally, and he has the power over others' deaths and can resurrect them, he can then give us eternal life. I think it's important that we can understand who he is. He has the power over death. And his resurrection is proof he paid for all sin. Because if he didn't raise, our faith is in vain. It's worthless. But our faith is not in vain. He's a resurrected Savior. And to be a Savior, you have to save some, someone from something to someone. Or that wouldn't be a Savior. To be a Savior, you have to save somebody from something to something. He saved us from the hell we deserve to heaven we don't. And our life has nothing to do with it. If we believe what he did for us, that's what matters. It's by faith. So I think it's very clear that Jesus Christ has the power to give eternal life to anyone that will come to him by faith. In John chapter 17, he makes a prayer just before he goes to the cross in John chapter 18. And he, I think he's in the Garden of Olives there praying. Could be wrong on that, but anyways, the point I want to make He's the one and true God. And look what he says here in John 17, 1 through 5. These words spoke. Jesus had lifted up his eyes to heaven and he said, Father, the hours come. The reason he was revealed in the flesh, the reason the Holy Spirit gave birth to, uh, to Mary and ultimately Jesus conceived in Mary there was for this hour. The hours come. Glorify the Son that thy Son also may glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh. He should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And ultimately we know that the Father draws everybody in in John 6, 44, but if you read 6, 6 45, it's about the Word, and that Word goes out, and he draws people in through the Word, through the Bible preaching we word, and that's why it's important that we use scripture to back things up. And it's sad today that a lot of pastors don't even use the Bible. They don't even, use, don't even quote scripture. But we try to, there's not a book, we try to use the whole Bible in our, in our messages. But at verse 3 here he says, And this is life eternal, that they might know the, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent, Obviously, it was the Father's will. I have glorified, glorified thee on earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Interesting comment there. See, in John chapter 12, I think it is, I didn't have this in there, but if you want to look over John, look at verse in chapter 12. I think it's pretty neat that he says these things in advance. Um, oh, it's John chapter 13, 19, and... I know he says it in another place. Two times he says it. But in John 13, 19, he says, now, now I tell you, before it comes that, when it has come to pass, you may believe that I am he. So he's telling us that he's finished the work, yet he didn't even go to the cross. But he tells us things in, these things in advance so we, we know that when they do come to pass, we know he's the Messiah. Remember, he declared his death three times. In all of the Gospels, he declared his death three times, his burial and resurrection three days later, three different times before it happened. So, verse 5 there. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. That's who he is. And we were in John chapter 11, verses 43 and 44. But in 25 through 27, in John 11, he says this, and Jesus said under her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, not water baptized, not dedicating your life to the Lord, he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet he shall live. Spiritually dead, now going to live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. That's a promise. Never die. When I leave this absent, yeah, I might die a physical death, but I don't die. My new nature goes to him. Those are encouraging words. Believest thou this? She said unto him, Yes, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, 
which should come into the world. Now let's go back to Corinthians, because we were looking at Corinthians there, because we were going to talk about James, when he ultimately sees him, believes him. Verse 3, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. That's the gospel that saves. It's believing that. And then he was seen of Cephas in verse 5, Peter. Then of the twelve, the apostles. And after that, he was seen of, seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep, some have died. So in 1 Corinthians was written by Paul, and it was probably right around 65 or 63 A.D., most of those individuals were still alive. Now it says Corinthians was written in 59 A.D. So most of those individuals were still alive, those 500 individuals. They seen Jesus Christ resurrect. In verse 7, after that he was seen of James, then of the all the apostles, and last of all he was seen of me also, Paul, seeing the resurrected Savior. For I am the least of the apostles, and I am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. James was in Jerusalem. We know that. Paul says that when he went up there. Then after three years I went to Jerusalem and to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. But other of the apostles saw I none except James, the Lord's brother. So it's after Jesus' death, James comes to Christ by faith. He's also involved in the church in Jerusalem. He was called the pillar of the church in Galatians 2, 9. And if you want to read a little bit more about James and his role, read Acts 13, 14, and 15. The first mission trip that Paul took, him and Barnabas in Acts 13 and 14. The Jews, they wanted to, they, they were saying, there were some Jews that saying, you first had to be a proselyte. You first had to become Jew first, you know, to get circumcised, be a law keeper. Then you could get saved. And ultimately James and Peter confirm, not so. Still working? But yeah, you can uh, look at Acts chapter 13 through 15. Let's go back to Judges chapter 11. Verse 3 through 7. Continue to read about Jephthah. Then Jephthah fled from his brethren and dwelt in the land of Tob, and there were gathered vain men into Jephthah and went out with him. And it came to pass in process of time that the children of Ammon made war against Israel. And it was so that when the children of Ammon made war against Israel, the children of Gilead went to fetch Jephthah out of the land of Tob. Oh, now they need him. And they said unto Jephthah, Come, be our captain, that we may fight with the children of Ammon. Jephthah said unto the elders of Gilead, Do, you, do not you hate me and, expel, and spell me out of my father's house? And why are you come unto me now when are you, in, you are in distress? Jephthah was not good enough for the inheritance, but he's good enough to save their lives. Have you ever been in a situation where you weren't good enough? For this, but you were good enough for that? I think we all can relate to that. We know someone that's good enough, you know, for salvation, but not good enough to serve, you know, even, you know, Jesus Christ. People will want to come to him, which is great. We're glad people can get eternal life. But we would love people to, you know, to get saved and want to serve him, you know? They could grow in grace and the knowledge of Christ. It's sad to see so many young men and women you know, fall by the wayside that they don't want to read, they don't want to ultimately learn, they don't want to share. You know, we need to train up some pastors and pastors' wives so people would want to serve God. You know, that next generation needs to be trained up. But we know life is about the four soils. The four soils are a great, you know, if you're here or online, you know, you are one of the four soils. And we know in Matthew chapter 13, God, Jesus Christ there, gives seven parables 
in Matthew 13. And if you can understand the first one, you can probably understand the rest. But the first one there, the first couple are important to understand. And one is the soils. Matthew chapter 13, 3 through 9, it says, And he spoke many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, the sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. I believe the, uh, it's in Luke chapter 8, 2, I think it is. 5, verse 5, Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, there they scorched. They were scorched, and because they had no root, they were withered away. Verse 7, Some fell among thorns, and thorns sprung up, choked them, but others fell on good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. See, the answers to the parable and man, actually Jesus Christ answers this parable. He gives them the answer. We know the sower, I think over it is in Matthew 13, 38 there. You know, we know the sower is Jesus Christ. But I want to talk about the soils here. In verse 18, he gives us who they are. Matthew 13, verse 18 through 23, it says, Hear you therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, and he catches the way that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receives seed by the wayside. This person's never saved. In verse 20, But he that received the seed in the stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it. So he's happy. Yet, in 21, yet hath not no root in him, but dureth for a while. It endures for a while, but when tribulation or persecution arise because of the word, oh, you're a Jesus believer? You're one of those people? By and by, he's offended. No, I'm not. I'm not one of those people. You know? The word's fallen on stony ground. Receives a little persecution and becoming a child of God. And we know ultimately, we know what happens. 22, and he also receives seed among the thorns, as he that heareth the word. And the cares of this world, and it's deceitful of riches, choke the word, and becometh unfruitful. But he that receives seed in, his, in the ground, good ground, as he that heareth the word, understandeth it, which also bears fruit, bringeth forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. The four soils are the first one, not saved. They did not understand, they believed not, the wicked one, Satan, the devil, removed the word. And when we see the little blackbirds come on scene, that's why, you know what, you don't want little blackbirds, you know, nesting in your hair. Every once in a while we get these little blackbirds that fly over our head, and they come to take those words away. You know, and so ultimately they'll stop some of them. You let those blackbirds nest in your head, nest in your hair, you're probably not thinking of the things of God. But we know what here the birds do. Satan, he comes to take that word. Second soil, they're all saved. Believers that experience trials in life related to the word of God, they become offended. I'm embarrassed of him. They did not yield to the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit and do not bear fruit. And ultimately, you know what? If you're going to be out there sharing the gospel, you're going to receive persecution. You know, people are going to make, they're going to make fun of you, but ultimately we know they're not making fun of us, they're making fun of him. The third soil is also a believer. They're all saved, but ultimately believers that cared more for things of this world. And you know what? In second, first Timothy chapter 6, you know, you can't take none of this with us. Money, lust, pleasures of this life choke the word of God out of their life. And had no fruit. I think some one day at the judgment seat of Christ, we're not judged for our sins, but these people will be shown what they could have had. What they could have had. Fourth soil, I hope that's what we all are. Believers who are not offended by the word of God, they do not care for the things of this word, world, but brought forth fruit. These individuals yielded to the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. This is the first parable that Christ gave in Matthew. It's an incredible parable. I think it's over in 10. You know, he talks about, you know, the harvest is great. 
but the workers are few. We need more workers. We need people that, you know, that want to get involved. You know, they want to you know, do things. They want to do a Sunday school. They want to do things. We need more people to step up. You know, this is what the ministry is about. You know, want people to, whatever the Lord is calling them, to go to call, whatever that is. You know, our life is just starting. Why not give it glory to God in our lives? So can a saved person be saved and not show any evidence that they're saved? Absolutely. Yeah. Remember, it's a spiritual birth. A person cannot see the spiritual birth. How do you know when a baby is born? You can see it. The physical birth. The baby, Scout, Paxton, Ezekiel, the baby, you can see it. It's a physical birth. But just be, you know, when you, there's a spiritual birth, there's no physical evidence. This is why every child of God should grow in grace and the knowledge of Christ. They're saved. How does a person do this? They read the word. When a babe in Christ reads the word of God, they're nourished by the word of life, grow in grace, grow into a mature child of God, and then they know that their visible works reveal their invisible faith. That's what the book of James is all about. A child of God does not work to be saved. A child of God does not work to be more saved. A child of God does not work to prove he's saved. Because that's a false message. A child of God does not work to keep being saved. See, once a child of God gets saved, how do we get saved? By born again, born of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit, capital S there, the Holy Spirit, is Spirit. Marvel not that I said unto you, you must be born again. When we know a person's born again, they get a second nature. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8 and 9. He that committeth sin is of the devil, the flesh. That's the old nature. It's all that it knows how to do. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifest, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Remember? We saw a verse back a little, destroy the works of the flesh. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he can't sin because he's born of God. Every child of God has two natures, a flesh nature, which you see, and then I have a spirit nature. And that's the one that lives forever. See, the flesh nature is the corruptible seed. It's the corruptible tree. Matthew chapter 7, 17 to 20, every says, so the new nature is the incorruptible tree. It says, even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth forth not forth good, good fruit is hewn down and cast in the fire. Wherefore, by your fruits you shall know them. Now, let's be clear here. Religion wants individuals to pick all the apples off the apple tree and replace them with lemons. Go hang lemons on your tree. It doesn't work that way. Any fruit that the, any fruit that the apple tree produces is always going to be an apple. Any fruit from the old nature will always be sin, even though it might look like, hey, that's, that's a good thing. That's a good. But ultimately, the motivation, God knows, and if it comes from the corruptible tree, it is a corruptible seed. It's a corruptible fruit. So anything from the flesh, even though it might look good, probably is done out of pride. It's corruptible. Any fruit from the new nature will always be good fruit. Again, it's not our job to go around and be fruit inspectors. That person's saved. That person's not saved. Some fruit inspectors like to, like to smother the light of others. They, go, they like to talk about other Christians. They want to smother their light so their light looks a little brighter. That's not Christian living. Our job is not to inspect each other's lives, but we are told to listen to the pastors because we know them by their fruit, by what they speak. In Matthew 7, 15, it says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ravening wolves. And he says in 7 there, 20, he says, you will know them by their fruits. In 1 John chapter 4, 1 through 3, we're supposed to test the spirits. This is not about me going around checking people's lives. This is about people that are preaching. You should test everything I say according to the word of God. In 1 John 4, 1 through 3, it says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits 
whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out in the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit, capital S, of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Did he come? Did he, did he die? Was he, did he hang on the cross? Did he pay for every sin? Did he resurrect? Because that's what the Spirit of God says. And verse 3, And every spirit that confessed not that Jesus has come in the flesh is not of God. There are individuals that deny the resurrection. That's a false spirit. That's a demonic message. And this is that spirit of Antichrist. That's his words, not mine. Whereof you have heard that it should come, even now already is in the world. The spirit of Antichrist is already in the world. We need to test the message of the pastors. We need to listen to what they say, and we need to ultimately, we'll know them by their fruit. So we need to test the message of a pastor. In Matthew chapter 12, he says this, verse 33 through 36. Either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt, for the tree is known by his fruit. O generation of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. We know them by what they speak. In Matthew chapter 12, Jesus is walking through the fields with his disciples, and ultimately the disciples pick some grain, and they're eating the grain on a Sabbath. And the Pharisees were judging them because they were ultimately took this grain, were eating it. They were saying there was work on the Sabbath. So he's correcting these individuals. And ultimately, it's not about, you know, the things you see that corrupt an individual. It's what comes from the heart. And verse 35, a good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. In Matthew 15, he says, be wary. He says, in Matthew 16, verse 6, I think it is, he says, a war be Warn yourself about the leaven of the Pharisee. In Matthew 15, 18 through 20, he says, But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornication, theft, false witness, blasphemy. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands doesn't defile a man. The Pharisees were adding things to the law, and ultimately their motives were impure. So again, we do not produce the fruit. We speak truth. And it's when speaking truth, that's what bears the fruit. See, in Hebrews 13, 15, it says this. I should have popped that verse up there, sorry. But Hebrews 13, 15 says this. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks unto his name. Speak truth. People get saved. They become a child of God. They hear more truth. Then they grow in grace and the knowledge of Christ. And soon they maybe will speak truth. And then others will get born. And others will grow in grace. That's how we pass it on. A person can see how the message of truth can bear fruit. Bear fruit a hundredfold, sixtyfold, and thirtyfold. The works of a child of God are to be fruitful. We want people to get saved, but we also want people to grow up in Christ. It's sad to see so many young men and women today, they get saved and then they want to get caught up in the world. And ultimately 10, 20, 30 years later, you know what, then they come back and they're like, man, why did I have? And we're just trying to train. I wish somebody would have shared that with me because ultimately I went down that path for a few years and it is... Nothing fruitful came from that, only but problems in my life. And Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus under good works. When do you teach a child to walk? Before he's born or after he's born? After he's born. So we want to never confuse salvation and service. We are very clear on the gospel. It's only to get saved. A person gets born again when they trust in Christ. Now after they're saved, we want them to grow up in Christ to become more like Christ. Because what did he do? He come to seek and save the lost. Every child of God is created in the image of Christ. To do what? Do what he did. Seek and save the lost. Luke 19.10, Matthew 18.11. Being fruitful is sharing the gospel of Christ. Because it's only the gospel that bears fruit. 
Look at Colossians 1, 5 through 6. This is why the gospel is so amazing. Colossians 1, 5 through 6. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof you heard before the world of truth of the gospel, which has come unto you as it is in all the world, that bringeth forth fruit, as it doth also in you since the day you heard of it, and knew the grace of God and truth. It's the truth of the gospel that brings forth fruit. That's why we speak truth. We bear truth. And the truth bears the fruit. In Titus 3, verse 14, let ours also be learned to maintain good works for necessary uses that they be not unfruitful. In John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him and the same bringeth forth fruit, bringeth forth much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. So it's about me sharing his word, sharing his truth. He's the one that does the saving. Apart from the gospel of Christ, nobody gets saved. That's our job is to bear truth. That's why we get saved by grace and we grow in grace. And we can understand that, that through the gospel, that's what it's all about. We never leave grace. We're saved by it, and we're to live by it. You know? It's about giving glory to Him in everything, yielding to the indwelling power of this Holy Spirit in our lives. Let's go back to Judges. In Judges chapter 11, verse 8, the elders want Jephthah to fight for them. In verse 9, Jephthah asks and says that if he comes home to fight for them, will I be your head? Will you, will you make me your captain? In verse 10, they agreed, you'll be our captain, you'll be our head. In verse 11, the elders and people of Gilead made Jephthah head and captain over them. Jephthah sends a message to the king of Ammonites. He says, why are you making war with me? In verse 12, why are you doing this to me? Why are you fighting against us? In verse 12, the king of Ammon answers, because you took our land away. In verse 13, Israel took our land. Jephthah sent the message back. So you could see them writing letters back and forth. And he says, we didn't take your land. Ultimately, from the land of Moab and Ammon, in verse 14, 15. Now, it's interesting that he uses the word Moab and Ammon here. Who was Moab and Ammon? Well, those were the two children of Lot. When he had, you know, laid with his own daughters. And how Moab and Lot how Moab and Ammon are still a problem for Israel today. The sins of some of these individuals have been just, the, this curse that comes with some sin in our lives has passed on. We're still dealing with like Ishmael today. And you know, and you know, the, you know, the Quran and the, the Muslims, you know, these are sins that have happened through Abraham and here Lot. In Genesis 19, 36 through 8, it says, thus were both the daughters of Lot with child by their father. And in 2 Peter chapter 2, I think it's verse 7, it says, Lot is a just man. He was saved. You know, if people, have, if their lives have to look like they're saved, well, that contradicts the Bible because Lot was a saved man, and here he laid with his own children. The firstborn bare a son and called his name Moab. The salmon, the same as the father of the Moabites unto this day. The younger, she also bare a son and called his ben Ami, the same as the father of the children of Ammon. Unto this day, Moab and Ammon are Lot's children. Guess what the city of Jordan's, the capital city of Jordan is today? It's called Ammon. If you didn't know that, you can look on the map. I believe it is true, purely the descendants of Ammon of this time. You're going to look at the word Edom that's coming up. Genesis 25, verse 30. Esau said to Jacob, feed me, I pray thee, with the same red pottage. I am faint, therefore his name was called Edom. Well, that was Esau, who was Jacob's older brother. He's the one that sold his birthright for a, a bowl of soup. Made me think about that a while. So the people of Edom are descendants of Esau. But what did Esau do? Sold his birthright for soup. And I believe we can learn something from that. I believe believers today do the same thing. They sell their birthright. They don't lose their salvation, but they love the world more than they love their father. They sell their birthright out. 
They're filled with the desires of the flesh. In 1 John chapter 2, 15, is God, Jesus is telling you, God's telling us, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. And I, man, I felt I was in love with the world. I wanted to be a millionaire before I was 30. Well, that didn't happen. I just got a bad back. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Not in fellowship. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Because it's all of the flesh. It's not of the Father, it says. But it's of the world. And the world passes away and the lust thereof. He that doeth the will of God abides forever. See, after a person is saved and comes a child of God, God wants his children to grow up. They want them to grow up and become good stewards and ambassadors of him in a foreign land. Verses 16 through 26, Jephthah explains how Israel wanted to pass through these countries. And these countries said no. The Moabites, Malachites there. And they actually came to war against Israel when Israel, when Moses brought them out of Egypt. Can we pass through your land? He went to these kings. If you read there in Exodus, he went to these places in Numbers. He says, can we pass through your land? They said, no. Matter of fact, most of them came out to war against them. They hated Israel. And through these fights, through these wars, they won the land. The Israelites smote them and possessed the land through war. These people mentioned in Judges chapter 11 brought this upon themselves when they would not let Israel pass through the land when they were coming out of Egypt. And if Jehovah God won the land for Israel, it's their land still today. For 300 years, in verse 26, there you can look at there in Judges chapter 11, 26. For 300 years, you did nothing. And now you want to say we took the land? And Jephthah goes on to say in, in Judges chapter 11, verse 27, he says, Wherefore, I have not sinned against thee, but thou dost me wrong to war against me. The Lord, the judge, capital J there, be judged this day between the children of Israel and the children of Ammon. And the king did not listen to Jephthah. In verse 28, the spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah. We know that. It says there in verse 29, and ultimately destroyed Ammon. In verse 33, it says there was a great slaughter of the Ammonites. Jephthah makes a mistake, though. He makes a mistake. And we as believers, as a child of God, I don't, I don't know why. It doesn't explain what he did here. But he made a vow. He made a vow in verse 30 and 31. I think it's clearly a warning for us. He said, this is what he said, And Jephthah vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, If thou shalt without fail deliver the children of Ammon into my hands, then I shall be, it shall be that whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me, when I return in peace from the children of Ammon, sh sh shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up as a burnt offering. I come up with two conclusions, but I could be wrong. Jephthah makes a vow. However, he does it in haste. He doesn't think. So I think there's a warning when we make promises to God. If you do this, God, I'll do this. If you let me get this job, I'll go to church every Sunday. And then you go for three Sundays, then you miss the next. You know, you don't, you don't think things through. I've done that. Or the other option I came up with is Jeff thought he already knew what was going to happen. He knew what was going to walk through that door. An animal was going to come through that door. He had maybe pre-planned it with one of his servants. And he says, you know what, Lord, you let me win. The first thing that comes through that door, I'll offer it up as an offering, a burnt offering. So either it was a mistake in haste or it was pre-planned. I don't know. He knew in advance what would come through the door. But something happens. His daughter comes through the door first. He vowed that the first thing would come through the door. He'd offer up as a burnt offering his daughter, his only child comes through that door. He shared with her what, what, what he said. Incredible what she says. She says, do to me according to what the vow, what, what proceeded out of thy mouth. She says, just give me two months. And at the end of Judges chapter 11, verses 34 through 40, he did according to his vow. She ended up dying. 
In Judges chapter 12, 1 through 7, Jeff, uh, you know, he did the right thing. He subdued the Am Ammonites. But his cousins, the Eph Ephraim, you can't read that, Genesis 12, 1 through 3, they were jealous. They were jealous. And let me read it. Then the Ephraim gathered themselves together and went northward and said unto Jephthah, Wherefore passest thou over to fight against the children of Ammon? And did not call us to go with thee? We will burn thine house upon thee with fire. We're going to kill you. And Jephthah said unto them, And I and my people were at great strife, great strife with Ammon, with the children of Ammon. And when I called you, so he's reminded, I did call you. You delivered me not out of, your, out of their hands. And when I saw that you had delivered me not, I put my life in my hands and passed over against the children of Ammon. And the Lord delivered them out of my hand. Wherefore then, then are you come up on this day to fight against me? Yeah, they did. The question I have here for you is, have you ever had people abandon you at the beginning of something? And they sure jumped on the bandwagon at the end. We see this, you know, churches today and now related to Calvary. They won't be with Christ at the beginning. They will deny his finished work. Nah, I'm not going to believe that. I'm going to trust in my own confidence and I'm going to get the glory. In Matthew 7, 21 through 23, it says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of, kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of the Father. What's the will of the Father? Read Ephesians 1, chapter 1, verses 1 through 13. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you work, you workers of iniquity. They want the glory. They trust in their own works instead of the finished redemptive work of Christ. They don't want to identify at the beginning, just like the Ephraimites with Jephthah, but at the end they want the glory. To rule and reign with Christ in the millennial kingdom, you must first to come to him by faith. Jephthah ended up going to war against Ephraim. And if you read Judges 12, 1 through 7 there, 42,000 Ephraimites end up dying. But let me recap here. Jephthah experienced many of the things that we experience today. Judged and treated unfairly because of what others have done. Judged by fellow family members. Treated unkindly because of an inheritance. Not good enough to be an heir and share the inheritance, but when life was in danger, they were quick to call. When making the right call and asking others to get involved and refused to help, refused to get involved, but when all is said and done, they could have had what you have, but now are jealous. Many things that we can learn from Jeff. Uh, a couple of the applications that I learned today before we close. Promise, even though, you do, even though you do the right thing for God, it doesn't mean there's not going to be hardship in your life. The prosperity gospel of health and wealth is a false doctrine. God does, God does promise a suffering in this life. However, they do not compare to the glory that will one day that will possess. It doesn't even compare. So if, we, if you can suffer for Christ, Great. The second application, is there a truth to proclaim? I would say God can use us regardless of our background, regardless of our last name or what we've done. God can use us. God can take a broken sinner saved by grace and use him for his glory or her for his glory. That's what the Bible's all about, broken individuals learning to trust, live by faith, and allow God to work through their life. Is there a sin to avoid? Yes. Be careful when making promises to God in haste. I said, J.F. Jephthah lost his only child because of his promise to God. 
being told. And we're a reminder that these individuals are sinners. Let me show you something online. If you're sitting here today and you've not seen this, look up here. This hand here represents you and I. This wallet here represents our sin. God loves us. He hates our sin. Sin separates us from God. Now, many churches will tell you today, if you get water baptized, give enough money, go to church, you know, it'll pay for sin. But we know that's not what the Bible says. My Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Let this hand you represent Jesus Christ. He's from eternity past. He's without sin. And John the Baptist, when he was on the banks of the Jordan, in John chapter 1, verse 29, he says, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He took our sin. He died. He rose again the third day, showing us payment for sin paid in full. If you'd believe that, he puts that to your account. If we all could just close our eyes for a second here. We'll close in prayer in a minute. If you're at home or here today, maybe you've not come to Christ by faith. You've just seen the good news. You've just seen how much God loves you. He'd rather die than have you go to hell. He loves you so much that he paid for all of your, all of your sin. And his resurrection is proof that he paid for all of your sin, even the sin you've not committed yet. An infinite God can make an infinite payment for sin at a finite moment of time. There's no way a person can be good enough to go to heaven. There's no church, pastor, or priest that can save anybody. You can all, a person can only be saved through Christ alone. Maybe you're sitting here today and you've never trusted in Jesus Christ alone and you're like, that makes sense. Maybe you could say something like this then. It's not what we say that saves you, but you can acknowledge a few things and it's what you believe, but you can say something like this. I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to go to hell. I don't want to go to hell when I die. I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins, was buried and resurrected for me, trusting in Christ alone to save me. If you did that, why don't you just tell your father thanks because you were just born again into his family. Trusting in Jesus Christ alone, he saved you from a hell you deserve to a heaven you don't, all by his grace. Let's close. Dear Heavenly Father, Father, again, we're just so thankful for the faithful people that come out and pray and give and support the church. So many of our brothers and sisters here today are traveling and not here with us today. We just pray that you be with them. And Father, we pray for a woman out there today, a child of somebody in the congregation here. We just, you know who she is, Father. And Father, we just pray that you would be with her that you would just surround her with your love, that you would guide her in her walk, that you'd give her the strength that she needs, give her guidance, and provide the comfort that only you can. Let her know how much she's loved. And we just pray that you would shine a light under her feet, guide her path to Father, protect her. We know the enemy roars around like a roaring lion whom he want, wants to devour. He's trying to destroy us, destroy our testimony. We just pray for protection for her. We know it's a spiritual battle out there, Father. We just pray that you be with her, her son, her family. Bless that family. And Father, we just again thank for all the people you brought out here today. We just pray that you bless these people and bring us all back next week where we continue to give glory to you. And Father, we do pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll have our last song. It is faith is found a resting place.